Could everyone please stand? Uh, our Kamatua Tame will open the meeting with a karakia, and then Reverend Stephen Black will open the meeting with a reading. Um, then they will also hand over to the Deputy Mayor, who will uh, lead an acknowledgement for a past councillor. Thank you, Tame. Uh, thank you. Te koro matua, te nā koe ngā mema o te kaunihira, te nā koutou ngā mema o te hāpori e pai nei, te nā koutou e te mai i tini e i taro aro. O te kaunihira o kiri kūru, kiri roa, tene te mihi atu ka koutou katoa. E te atua kaharawa anai mātou e tuku whakamoe me te tia koe, kia koro wai mātou katoa, i tō aroha, i tō tumanako, e hi koe, i rungi i te tongi kura, hei pupuru ki te aroha me ngā taonga, heka mai i te rangi ki te whenua. Nā kutia hoki te kengi, e whakakotahi te iwi, i rungi te aroha, me te tūmana ko hoki. Koe nei mātou e tuku whakamoe me te tia koe, i rungi te ingoa tau mātou kai whakaora, mā ake ake, āmini. Kia ora whānau. Yesterday I was looking for some inspiration for today's reading and prayers, and so I turned to your council agenda for today may not have been one of my strongest strategies. Um, but as I was turning through the pages, there was a glimpse of hopefulness around the phrase uh, hospitality or entertainment policy, but that quickly faded into page after page of tables. A particularly memorable one was balancing the books. It's on about page 26, you'll come to it later today. Um, and I confess that the useful part of my brain checked out at that moment until I was reminded by a little, of a little piece of scripture from Thessalonians. Always be joyful, keep on praying. No matter what happens, always be thankful for this is God's will. And that helped me have a little moment of civic pride. And I did not grow up in the Waikato and I had no aspirations to live in Hamilton. And I've not been here very long, but as I stood with my wife in the Hamilton Gardens on the weekend and that gorgeous sunshine at that festival that you have sponsored and those gardens that you engineered, I was joyful and I was thankful. Um, the work that you have done and that your ancestors in this place have done is a gift that makes life better. So when you look at your agenda and your tables today, know that I will continue to pray. I will continue to encourage you to pray, to be joyful, and no matter what happens, may you be thankful. Amen. I'll hand up. Thank you very much for uh, coming in and doing our karakias and thank you Stephen, Reverend Stephen Black for being a part of this and bringing um, your uplifting readings or scriptures so we do appreciate that, I certainly do so thank you okay we'll now hand over to um, the Deputy Mayor um, Martin Gallagher Councillors may be seated obviously okay <coughs> um, Uh, it is obviously with sadness that we acknowledge the uh, passing uh, of uh, the late Joe DeMeyer, who was a, a councillor here for two terms and was a colleague, obviously, of Andrew O'Leary's and Dave McPherson's. But in the sadness that is passing, uh, obviously, we should also be uh, celebrating uh, because the reference was just made about the people who have helped build this community over many, many years, for two or three hundred years, actually, in reality, of our human habitation. Uh, and Joe DeMaio will go down as one of those people who helped give Hamilton a little more vitality, a little more colour, a little more excitement. And Joe DeMaio, as a young man, came obviously all the way from Italy and had to reinvent himself in a predominantly English-speaking society. And the journey from, uh, dare I say it, the Naples area to uh, Murapara is quite significant, in my <laughs> view, culturally. Uh, but of course, um, 
he, as I learned, eventually, uh, apart from being, as I understand, a hairdresser there and, and doing cabinet work and all the things, he, he was had two terms on the Murapara Borough Council, so he had the local government history even way back then. As we all know, he was a larger-than-life character, uh, an extroverted and boisterous expatriate, Italian businessman, uh, who made Hamilton obviously his home for over 40 years and became an integral part of our uh, community. But what I loved about Joe, obviously, is he never lost his Italian culture, that, that passion, as we know with Italians, uh, and that wonderful sort of um, joy uh, for life. And uh, those of us, of course, who remember, and many of us do, is, is his wonderful gelato restaurant, iconic uh, Hamilton eateries, and it was his dream to open a place like that. And of course, he of course took great pride. It wasn't just a business. Uh, when he, you know, he served his Italian pizza and gelato and espresso from his famous <coughs> golden machine, uh, which of course was a feature of his <coughs> restaurant, just as much as Joe's uh, lively conversation. He wasn't there just turning up for work. For him, that that business was his pride and his joy. And of course, as we know. Lots of Hamiltonians over the years uh, got to know Joe in conversation, and of course, uh, he was um, consequently uh, elected uh, to the council. And um, with Gordon Chesterman and, and uh, Roger Henneberry, of course, they were part of the three group who helped give us the Christmas tree. So if there's going to be one legacy every Christmas, when those lights go on, Many of us will still think of Joe. That will be one of his lasting uh, legacy. Uh, in my view, he was not only an amazing legend of the central city, but he demonstrated the wonderful vitality that people who have the courage to come from their home country on the other side of the world and come to this country. And over those 40 years, uh, he was an Italian Kiwi or whatever, but he was both Italian, he was both Kiwi, he blended the best. And of course he left that amazing um, legacy. And without further ado, and I know one or two others may want to say things as well, um, he was just, not only was he a great Kiwi, Italian, but he was a great, great Hamiltonian. And uh, he left, in my humble view, a very, very significant foot footprint. Rest in peace, Joe. Uh, we'll just honour um, Joe with a moment's silence. Uh, was there anyone else who wanted to say a word for Joe? Okay, sure. Should I just say something? Yes. Okay. Um, look, I, <laughs> as an expat, I was actually very grateful for Joe and his uh, cafe. Um, when I first came to Hamilton, it wasn't easy. Um, speaking German mainly and a little bit of English and um, and going to his cafe it was just a wonderful wonderful place where I could have a little bit of home um, here in the middle of Hamilton and uh, he made me always feel welcome he made me always feel that this is the right place to live um, loved his wall where all the people wrote on the wall um, and and just set, set notes and and you just felt like uh, wow you're not on your own um, you're, you're with, um, with other people that feel exactly the same. It's tough at the start to be in a different country with different people, different culture. And yeah, I might look like everybody else, just like Joe did, but we, we bring our culture here and we bring our past here. And, and I'm forever grateful for him, to him that he made me feel so welcome right at the start when I was new here. Thank you. Rest in peace, Joe. We'll just have a moment of silence. Yep. Please stand.
Thank you, councillors. Uh, so I just want to acknowledge um, Deputy Mayor Martin Gallagher for his um, political respect for traditions, uh, etiquette, order, and um, observances of, of the old systems and ensuring that we um, bring those into our meetings. So um, I acknowledge you for that, Deputy Mayor Martin Gallagher. Uh, before we open, I just want to hand over to Kaylee um, to introduce your guests. Um, so. So could I just ask each of you to stand up um, with your name and what course you're doing? Thank you. Okay, so I just want to um, re remind members that this is actually a governance-led project, um, so we just acknowledge the governance team around the work they're doing on this as well. Right, so we'll open this um, Council Annual Plan meeting on the 26th of February 2019. It's 9.45am, and uh, I will start with apologies, um, Democracy Manager Leanne. Kia ora tātou and welcome Wintech students. Uh, so this morning we have apologies from Councillor McPherson and Councillor Taylor. Are there any others? Uh, Chair, I'd like to record my absence from the meeting from 11 o'clock this morning, possibly for up to 90 minutes. OK. Um, I'll move, seconded by Councillor Mark. Uh, all those for? Any against? Carried. Um, I, th I think we'll have the first break at 11 if that's helpful to you. So just use some time while you're away. Um, if you can remind me, Liam. Uh, co uh, confirmation of agenda, I'll hand over to Democracy Manager Leanne Jordan. Thank you, Mayor Andrew. So this morning, everyone, in confirming the agenda, uh, we ask that you note that it's proposed that the debate will be two minutes with an extension of one minute if required, and that late item nine, which is the Waikato Regional Airport Limited creation of hotel subsidiary company, be accepted. This item was circulated late to you uh, as the request was received on the 22nd of February 19, 2019, and the decision is required to be made before the 13th of March, i.e. before another council meeting. Thank you. Okay, moved by Councillor Gary, seconded by Councillor Rob. No, no, no. Sorry. Uh, or concern. Look, I'm, I'm disappointed that the debate time is down to two minutes with a one minute extension. Currently, standing orders provides for five minutes. Uh, in discussions around the new standing orders, which I believe may be brought to the next council meeting, uh, in the discussions we've had thus far, um, th there was a very strong support for annual plan and long-term plan uh, meetings to revert to the, to back to the five minutes uh, instead of the two plus one minute that we've tended to have during this term for, for council meetings. So I'm asking that we have five minutes um, um, for this because it is a, an annual plan meeting.
is there a particular paper that you'd like it extended for? I mean, uh, uh, five minutes is an, over an hour of debate alone. Um, is there a particular yep. paper that you'd like that um, increased for rather than uh, everything that we talk about today? Well, prior to coming to the meeting, I would have thought that the annual plan discussions would have been five minutes. Um, but after reading um, a number of uh, emails that I've had in connection with items five and six, we may need additional time in debate for uh, items around the uh, contribu uh, development contribution. And also C3, I think, may require five minutes. So pretty much most of the meeting, uh, as I see it, uh, Mayor Andrew. Three, declarations of interest, which is... C3. 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 Yeah, yeah, sorry. So I'm suggesting, uh, I'm suggesting C5, C6, C7 and, sorry, sorry, items 5, 6, 7 and item C1. Okay. So, um, it's been moved by, that's been moved by Councillor Rob, seconded by Councillor Paula. Um, we'll go to the board to vote on this one. Okay, uh, Councillor Paula. Um, just, um, just as I was go going to speak in support of Rob because we only recently had that um, discussion on the standing orders and we determined that there were some key information points that might require an extension. I think the annual plan and the long-term plan were in fact two of those points where we considered. Having said that, I'd like to think that not all councillors take up the allotted five minutes if, they, if it's not necessary. Thank you. Um, look, Councillor Rob, if that's what you want, I'm happy to move that as the chair so we don't really need to go to the vote on this. So, so you're asking for 5, 6, 7 and C3, is that right? Uh, 5, 6, 7 and, and yes, C3, yes. Okay. All right. So everyone comfortable with that? Okay. Uh, Councillor Angela. Sorry, what, can we have the motion on the board? Um, just a question, a process to the, the governance manager. The sta and standing orders say that it is five minutes until we actually change standing orders. So is this motion correct then? Because the status quo is five minutes, isn't it? The status quo is five minutes. Mm. Until such time as we yeah. approve updates to standing orders, yes. they, they provide for five minutes for debate. Okay. So I've ex I've, as a chair, I've agreed with what you want, Councillor Rob. Do you still want to go through with your what a mess. motion? Because no, there is... Five, six, no, look, I'm, 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 that's exactly what I would like for this meeting. Um, but I am disappointed that we had already discussed um, potentially five minutes uh, as, as being the norm for but annual plan and long-term plan thus far without having, uh, without having a, a voted in or approved the long-term plan, the, sorry, without having approved the new standing orders. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm just suggesting that this is consistent with the discussions that we've had to date and certainly with current standing orders. Okay. Um, so uh, confirmation of agenda was moved by Gary, seconded by Councillor Mark. All those for? Any against? Sorry, sorry, Gary, you can't talk. We're in the middle of the vote. Motion is carried. Uh, Councillor O'Leary dissenting. Okay, we're now moving to declarations of interest. There are no declarations of interest flagged. Uh, public forum. Uh, there is no, no public forum. Okay, and we're now moving to item five on page six. Uh, thank you, Greg. Carsons. Good morning, Mayor and Councillors. 
Um, this item is the development contributions policy update. Um, it's a paper recommending um, updates to the DC policy, um, of which uh, in accordance with a typical annual plan process. Um, this isn't a review there. Any changes to the policy itself are, are very minor, and it includes um, updating the capital program. It recommends updating the capital program. <clears throat> um, and I'll just let you know that so up, um, the updates uh, at the moment are um, subject to finalisation. Um, there's a briefing on the 6th of March where draft charges and the, um, the final modelling will be bought. So we have some inputs that are left to be confirmed. So we've sort of got indicative modelling um, where we have the information. And this is um, to advise of the direction of, of travel at this stage and recommend an option. Um, and yeah, I'll take questions on the paper. So, Greg, could I just get you to introduce yourself and um, yes. General Manager Jen Baird, um, um, for, particularly for the camera? Sure. Um, uh, my name is Greg Carstens. I'm the Unit Manager of Growth Funding and Analytics, and this is Jen Baird, who's the General Manager of Growth. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Gary. Thank you. Uh, and just a sort of a housekeeping thing. Um, significance is assessed at... Um, I can't even see this. Not considered the key considerations, blah, blah, blah. So what, what are you asking us to do? This is... Is this a fait accompli? Or is this um, going out to some form of consultation? So this is not a fait accompli. Um, you it, understand French? Too, eh? Cool, eh? <laughs> I don't know what it means. <laughs> Zut de l'or. Um, so every year we update the DC policy. Typically, um, that would mean just updating the capital program and potentially the um, growth, any changes that we know about in the growth projections. Just to be clear what you said then, updating the capital program is just putting the numbers in of additional or um, rescinded projects. That, yes, that yeah. just means sinking it. Since so, the last time, yeah. Yeah, there's a capital register, which is what the um, which is in P Soda, which is what the um, capital program is registered with, and the DC policy is synced with the capital program as at the long-term plan, uh, plan adoption, or just prior to that actually. So we, this is just a just to make sure that the DC schedule of assets matches the uh, capital program in the the, the asset Ten register. Yeah. Um, typically. This, an annual plan update to a policy doesn't, cha doesn't have any fundamental policy changes. We're not changing the structure of the policy or how it is applied or anything like that. Um, in this case, there's a, there's a little, we've just deleted a clause which has been problematic and misunderstood um, and doesn't really add much value, so we've recommended that. But in, by and large, this is just a case of updating the policy with um, the information to make it match you know, the organisation's capital program. Um, and so this is really uh, um, to take it to council and say these are the changes that are recommended um, or these are, these are the updates and we'll come to a briefing, confirm the numbers and then um, because the charges are likely to increase, they, there's a consultation required. So on the 4th of April we're, it's proposed to go out to public consultation and uh, we would take a draft set of charges and any amendments to the policy to that public consultation. Okay, and the amendments to the policy are updating for the new capital projects and things like that? That's right. A and um, the stuff we have discussed previously about um, changing our policy from, by default, taking the DCs at the resource consent stage and perhaps at our, at Council's discretion, uh, moving that to the building consent stage or and or the um, connection of services stage. So that's actually, that is the next item. Um, oh, beg your pardon. All, all I'll say about that is that the opportunity to do that already exists, um, and nothing in oh, this... Oh, beg your pardon, this is the gross... E sorry, yeah. this is so, the gross... So really Mellett, the, key, the key thing. changes that are highlighted in the staff recommendation, so there's the updating for the capital projects, um, the definition of gross floor area, and amending the wet industries clause so there's, it's very specific to the I'm all, the I'm all exercised over to the next one. <laughs> yep. Councillor Angela. Thank you. Um, 
So just so I'm, I'm trying to get clear on what this report is asking me to do, is that you've identified some future planned capital projects that have been left out of the schedule of assets and therefore haven't been calculated for future DCs. Is that correct? Um, it's slightly bigger than what you're making it sound like with the previous um, elected member with a few changes to the policy. Isn't so it? yeah, it's right. It's correct in part. Mm. Yes. Um, so there's four activities that we're dealing with: stormwater, transport, wastewater, yep. water supply. So, in the case of stormwater, transport, and wastewater, that's um, a process of uh, well, for example, stormwater. The that program of works wasn't complete when we put the DC policy through and it needs to meet, touch certain marks like confirm that it's capex and have the cost allocations done which means it needs to have a level of certainty so now that works complete it's proposed to come in transport there were some growth elements identified in some of the cycleway projects and other safety upgrades which would be a, a low percentage as far as the water supply goes, so the upgrade to the water treatment plant was probably what you're referring to in that there is a QA process which um, is to make sure that the capital register matches the DC schedule of assets and that QA process did not um, pick up that asset, so that asset was um, left out as you say. Um, we've reviewed that process and we've um, updated the process for the, for the QA but in effect that's a mistake on um, it the staff level at my, at my, um, through my team and uh, so the recommendation is being that it's a growth um, project that it should be in the policy to be recovered and the mitigation uh, in terms of risks to revenue and council is that um, uh, the, and the net, net revenue effect is, is uh, negligible because um, everything is um, present value and recovered over um, decades. Uh, it does mean that there's an increase in there will be an increase in charges. So we've calculated it um, at a gross level of around a thousand dollars as a citywide charge, and so that's something that I think would be okay. unexpected um, in that case. So yeah, that's where I, I want to tease out. out the rest of this with my questions. Thanks, Greg. So um, it would have been more helpful for the report to have been a little bit more plain English to act. So I. Um, could ha so that was easily identified that we have we have done a schedule of assets and assets have been left out we haven't charged for future DCs um, now in the schedule of assets that we had come through that 2018 LTP have we then gone back and looked at that schedule of assets to make sure that we haven't left anything else are you a hundred percent confident that this is all that you've found so we've undertaken a comprehensive uh, QA process which will be repeated uh, following the, the, you know, the confirming these assets and bringing them into the schedule. So obviously we're sort of acutely aware of it and, uh, you know, it's a little bit embarrassing um, it's leaving okay. it out no, like, like that. So yeah, yeah, yeah. We just need the, to be the, transparent the is, yes, in our reporting yep. when we make a mistake and that hasn't happened yep. yet. Okay, so the answer is yes, there is a, um, we're confident that we've captured the all items, but as Greg's saying before, prior to actually going out to consultation, we'll be re-running re -running that process again just to make sure we have the correct information at that point in time. What was the value of all of the assets that have been missed off the register? Just a ballpark figure? So the water, the missed asset, the water treatment plant, is um, 26.9 million of which, as far as DCs are concerned, the capex is 23.6 million. And the other, uh, the other assets combined, the transport and the other assets that have been missed off? Uh, well, as I said, they haven't been missed off. They've um, been assessed um, to be candidates to come in, but that total is, uh, just adding it up in my head, 4,747, um, around $130 million. That's gross capex, that's the DC amount itself is about 80 million. Okay, and the other part, uh, the options, so we've basically got to find, so with the missing assets and the ones that have been reassessed to go, uh, revalued basically, to go into, to have the schedule of assets updated, um, the options on the table that you're asking us to decide on today are we include, uh, we basically push the cost of the recovery, uh, push the cost onto the development community, 
or, and please correct me if I'm wrong, because again, it was a little bit to, uh, hard to understand the report. We could charge every ratepayer a thousand dollars, and then another one to four thousand dollars a year. Is that what your report said? So it would be the development community, um, not the ratepayer. But it, your report does say that there. You mentioned a charge to every ratepayer of $1,000 and another charge of between one and $4,000 a year. Which um, paragraph is that, Councillor O'Leary? Um, yeah, sorry, I'm working electronically. Um, yeah, five. On page seven it says, this increase is likely to be approximately $1,000 to the citywide charge per household Okay, so that's and a household unit equivalent, so it's to the development community, so, so each house, yeah, so a Huey is a DC developer related um, okay. uh, component. Look, I need to say also, when you talk about your options, um, in, a, in a paragraph 36 there's an alternative option for council, which is a legitimate option to exercise its rights under the Local Government Act, um, there's a provision in the um, DC legislation to just PPI, which is a producer price index, just PPI, it's charges. Um, that requires no consultation. Yeah. Um, no, I understand that, Greg. I, I didn't, it wasn't clear to me what you were actually saying in the report. That's why I've questioned that. So it is not, you're not suggesting an option to charge the rate payer. You're saying that that would be, because it's on the QE, that one to, well, it's one and another charge of one to four. So $5,000 on every household unit equivalent to a developer to build a house? No, there's a $1,000 um, increase. Well, this is just early modelling, a $1,000 yeah. QE increase citywide, which means every developer. There, at the early allocation stage, there are, in fact, there is probably one um, catchment in particular, which is Infill West, which, um, because of the nature of the capex, would probably attract more charges than the other. I think that, um, most of the catchments in the city would it, could potentially increase between two to five percent, and that other catchment could potentially increase uh, more than that. Okay. Um, just one, a uh, couple of other questions here. Just on. Um, okay. So, so in terms of. Whatever option we decide to go for, the, the policy needs to be updated and this has to go out to the community. Is Correct. It under SCP. Is this under special consultative? It is, isn't it? Because the DC policy is significant. So, well, the advice I've taken, verbal advice, in, in fact, is um, that it uh, does not require an SCP, yeah. um, but it requires a, a level of consultation which I'd need to take further advice on. And is the schedule of asset informed by our, uh, what are they called? Asset management plans? Um, it is, uh, yes, if you, if you go back into the machine that far, yes. So how did it happen, just to... How did it happen? Yeah. Um, there's an asset reg uh, in PSODA, which is Council's asset register system. For each uh, project in there, there is a tick box which says um, DCs or not. If you tick the box, it means it's DC recoverable. If you don't tick the box, then when we do the data transfer through the API from the data register to the DC model, uh, if you have not ticked DC uh, recoverable, it will not transfer that asset. And so the way that the QA worked um, left an opportunity for that to happen. It doesn't anymore. Um, and I guess with 900 projects, it's unfortunate that it was a significant project. Um, so we've, we've just yep. got to deal with it now. We do have to deal with it now. And the, uh, we can update this. When we have re-evaluations re and, and uh, if we're going in and we're doing seismic um, work on an asset or something, we can update that schedule at any time without having to advise the policy. This is just because it was a significant asset that was left out and, and then you're also taking the opportunity to add in the re-evaluation of reassessment of the other ones. Is that, is that about right, normal process? So you can 
you're certain not to trigger consultation if you just PPI yeah. your charges so long as none of them increase. If any charge increases at all, you then uh, move into a situation where you may require consultation. And if charges increase by some material amount, then yeah, there is a requirement to consult. And if it's a review of some substance, then you're probably in an SCP situation. And did you look at other, like final question, did you look at other options to uh, to look for savings to cover this cost rather than push it on to developers or ratepayers? So the DC really is just an end user of the of the council's uh, capital program, so I don't have uh, influence over, over whether or not we increase any particular uh, asset of any amount. But basically, as I said, it's a data transfer from the asset register, so we're really just uh, the, at the uh, tail end of the process. So maybe CE, could you yep. answer Yep, so that um, one? ultimately the uh, capital program's always subject to significant rigour, and through the 10-year plan process, this was an item that was considered and challenged, um, so it's not something we can do without. The other aspects of the capital program have been as optimised as they can, so there was no opportunity to pull other capital programs out without impacting on the level of service or our ability to meet growth demands. So you're, you're absolutely comfortable that the elected wing wouldn't want to see any other options other than what's in this um, in front of us it, today? If there were other options, it would be a decision about whether or not we want to pursue our growth agenda. But that's yeah. what I'm saying. Yep. <coughs> yep. So if that's the indication that the elected members want to pursue, then there's a whole lot of work that needs to be done for that. And that was robustly... So if you remember, the 10-year plan was robustly debated, which included this programme. Right, so the whole... Yes, I do remember that. Yeah, well, see, Quite I was... fondly. Yeah, fondly. No, not. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I was more talking about the process we went yep. through rather than the 10-year plan itself. Everyone remembers the 10-year plan, and some people still have scars from it. Um, the 10-year um, the plan in itself had reference to the entire capital program. Our capital uh, projects that were uh, identified as part of the 10-year plan, the balance sheet, the debt, and so forth, was there, so all that optimisation and challenge had been identified. The uh, development contribution policy, or sorry, the development contribution model sucks that information out and then makes a determination in terms of the level of DCs that get applied for it. If you want to go back and actually challenge the capital program, that is actually a question of the process we went through for the 10-year plan. Mm. Okay, so there's a significant amount of work there in terms of understanding. And my view is we go to quite a significant level of detail to determine whether or not we build a capital program that meets our demands as a city that's growing as we are. Um, it would be a question of whether or not we would have wanted to pursue a certain growth agenda or not, rather than whether or not we wanted to leave certain assets out or not. Thank you. And Councillor O'Leary, I'll take your feedback on the highlighting the report. I'm a big fan of plain English. Thank you. Councillor Rob. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, first question is around public consultation, which is in the staff recommendation under paragraph two. How do you propose to undertake um, public consultation on this matter? Because there's no notes here at all in the report suggesting how that might be undertaken. And I'm responding to a couple of emails that I've received in the last 24 hours, as indeed some other councillors also have, about the lack of consultation up to this particular point. Um, so we ha we're still narrowing down exactly what the practicalities of that are. Um, I've consulted with our engagement uh, and communications team. Um, we, on the 6th of March, we come back to Council uh, in, a, in a briefing, um, which is where we'll have um, more of a fully formed um, engagement strategy. But I would say that it's, um, uh, it's more than um, a mail-out, and it's, um, it's not, uh, you know, a number of um, uh, public engagements at town halls, etc. The, the developer community is diverse, but um, it's also you know, not that large. So, uh, you know, I defer to the, the experts about how we make sure we touch all the right touch points. Um, perhaps, Natalie, do you have any... Um... I'll add something in here. Are you um, add something? I, 
I just jump in, Natalie. Um, so we've got we've got good communication channels into the development community um, on a number of fronts, both uh, in being in front of them on a regular basis, but also email databases. So we would make sure that we used those so that that community were well aware of the the trajectory of this as and when that decision gets made. Okay. And we'd also involve um, legal support to make sure that we are actually um, achieving the outcomes we're after as well. Yeah, sure. Um, and I, I'm not sure whether it's relevant to ask this question now or on mm -hmm. item six, but I think the two are related. And that is, why are we not publicly consulting on the matters in item six uh, as part of this public consultation? Um, that is... Do you want to be, leave that for item yeah, six? Yeah, it is item six, I think, yeah. But I mean, happy to answer it, but let's answer it in the next item, shall we? Okay, that's fine with me, yep, yep. And the last question I've got is under 2A... I just wonder if um, where you've got the uh, Council's integrated growth funding modelling environment be updated to reflect, and you've got the word any, I just wonder if the word any could be changed to all relevant, given that any to me sounds a bit regulatory in the sense that, well, if we think it's necessary, we will, we will do it because it's any change. I just wonder if we're being a little more specific so that we're giving an opportunity for, uh, during the public consultation, for the relevance around the changes that we're going to make uh, being um, proven to that particular group. I'm happy with that change. If I think that's fine. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, and thanks I'm on the right report this time. <laughs> um, uh, Greg, this, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, this is a reconciliation error, isn't it? Yes. So you've got a, a schedule of assets one side and another schedule of assets on another side. Correct. Um, so why didn't someone just look and say that total's not the same as that total, or is it not that mm. simple? Unfortunately, it's not that simple. I mean, simple. this is a shocker, to be honest. Well, it's an incorrect... It's a shocker. That shouldn't have happened. No, it shouldn't have happened. Yeah. And these things do happen from time to time. Yep. And we can't, couldn't fix it last time. We're trying to fix it now, Gary. OK, Gary, so Gary, is it as simple as saying what I've just said? No, because um, there are not all projects are growth projects. Not all aspects of a project are growth projects. There's um, analysis that's done. There's aspects that, like Greg said before, of the 100-odd, 30-odd odd million of items that we've updated only $80 million of those will have DCs collected against them. It's not a black and white scenario. There's different percentages for different projects based on who benefits, who caused it, and so forth. So this is quite complex. Now, the simple part about it, though, is making sure that tick was in the right box, and that mm. is pretty simple. But once it's ticked, then we have to identify what portion of it is growth and so forth as well. So there's <laughs> steps beyond it. But the simple part is okay. if there's a tick in the box or not. Okay. And we've been doing this for years. No, we haven't. Have we not? No, because if you recall, we had a new system we've implemented. OK, but the concept has been around for years. Been doing, there was always a list of assets that had to be somehow funded. And those, the, the, the ones that are ticked to be funded through DCs had to get into that, yep. into that, that column over there, and then we, then we allocate that based on some, some yep. basis. Yep, so firstly, I just want to, in response to Councillor Leary's question, all 10-year plan capital projects are funded. The question is who funds them, whether it's out of debt yep. which gets repaid by yep. DC, uh, DCs or debt that gets repaid for by ratepayers. But yeah, it's just pretty much a tick box exercise. We've been doing something similar to this, but the new system that we've implemented it's, approaches it slightly differently. But the reconciliation process now works, mm -hmm. and we're going to double check it to make it do, sure it does work. So, I mean, I'm, I'm not happy with this. I mean, it's, you talked about, I, when you say QA, I assume you meant quality assurance, did you? Yeah, yeah that's okay. right. So um, I just wonder if the audit, I mean, the audit and risk committee might have some view on what's going on here. Um, I just, I, I'm just not sure that the people who made the mistake should be the people who are, or, 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 or is there some level of governance that needs to be well, watching this? Because we're talking material figures. We're not talking. I'm, I'm, more, and than, I'm more than I'm more than comfortable to report this to the audit and risk committee. I'm not. Um, particularly I'm just not sure how, how it's going to be fixed. Um, so ultimately it has been fixed and we'll make sure that we double check the totals. There's another team that gets involved in this as well and we'll make sure that they independently check 
that those items they've identified with the tick box have been carried forward as well. So there is a double check in this context also as well. So it's not just relying on uh, one team's shoulders to ensure this is correct. There are multiple teams now ensuring that it is. And if there's something that doesn't align, then we'll make, it, make sure it's aware, that you're aware of it. So how come that didn't happen the first time? To be fair, it was in the flurry to lead to the 10-year plan. It the, was what? It was the, uh, the, the, the haste in terms oh. of preparing information for the 10-year plan. We're under significant pressure. The workload required to prepare a 10-year plan is significant, and in that process it was unfortunate, and it's not ideal, but a mistake was made. And this was an 11th hour mistake, to be fair. It wasn't like um, people were sitting on their fingers, which you know, I know you're not suggesting that, Councillor Mallet, but this wasn't a, um, you know, a, yeah, it was a mistake that was made under a significant amount of pressure that led to this, but now we've made sure that our steps are documented and we have in place a system to ensure this is correct going forward. Okay, so is there a check and balance somewhere so that it can't go forward next time? Yes, there is. Uh, and it can't a... occur next time. So, what, okay, maybe that's a bit technical to discuss here, but I'd like to know what that is yep, we and can, who's and responsible for it and when it gets done and it's got to be in our standard operating procedures and all sorts of stuff so that I, it doesn't I, happen again. I totally agree with you, Councillor Miller, and I think that maybe the best way to actually have that conversation is to prepare a, a, a short paper for the Audit and Risk Committee that outlines all of that items you've discussed to take it forward to give you confidence that everything's in check now. Thank you. <coughs> yeah. Um, Greg, gener generically speaking, DCs have, have doubled since our re recent policy. Would that be fair? Yep. Um, based on our pro you know, projected DC revenue for the next financial year, if this goes ahead, what percentage increase would that be on the new levied amount, roughly? So I don't have those numbers. So the, the modelling hasn't been finalised, and really that's uh, David and the Finance Department. Um, will. I, I'm not sure what other, you know, there's a number of changes, I'm sure, that's happening um, within their finance system. Generally speaking, uh, I would say that it's pretty revenue neutral um, in the long, uh, you know, overall with a, maybe a marginal increase. But I, again, that... But work hasn't been completed, and, and perhaps David, have you got a, anything to say on that? We'll bring it to the information of the briefing, won't we, David? Yep, we yep. can bring that to the briefing. No, but with respect, we're voting on this today. So, can anyone give an indication of percentage increased on the existing DC revenue projections for the next financial year, and how this is going to impact on them? Um, at this stage, I'd say between two to five percent. Okay. Oh, and also, as this is going back to consultation, oh, hang on, I just want to get clarity on it. Would you, was that 2 to 5 per cent, would you hang your hat on that, finance manager? Um, the, so, so initial discussion with Greg is it wouldn't make a material impact on the DC policy, so we but that's based over a 30 DC year, revenue. that's based over a 30-year program, isn't it? Yeah, so in terms of the 10-year plan, we haven't modelled any increase because we don't believe there is a material increase. Mm -hmm. But... Um, Looks like Greg and I will be doing some talking after this to um, try and nut that out. Um, okay. Because the way I read it, a thousand dollar increase to a Huey is a material increase. Yep. So, so can I just be absolutely clear today? You're making a decision on whether or not um, we prepare the consultation document effectively. That's correct. And then we come back on the fourth of April to go out to consultation. That's correct. So, and, and before then, you'll have a briefing with the details. So, today is about instructions to prepare. I'm making sure that's clear. Instructions to prepare the document for consultation. Then we're going to come back on the 4th of April to hit the go. Is that correct, GM? I think this is... Yes, the, that's correct. Yeah, so... Although there's a briefing, Richard, in, on the 6th of March, so that's when sort of we... This... Uh, the numbers will be collated and the um, consultation plan will be solidified. Yep, so to make it really clear, we have... Today, you're, you're, we're seeking your approval to go away and prepare some work. Then we're going to bring it back, and through a briefing, we'll bring you up to speed about those changes then. And then on the 6th of April, we've got a decision to make whether or not you go to consultation or not, or ultimately agree with the outcome that's been baked, to be fair, then a decision to go forward for consultation as well. And all the information will be made available at the briefing um, as well. So we're not baking it in today. We're effectively indicating where we're going to go from a staff direction point of view. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. I've read your report and I've put lots of highlighters and things all over it. And, but I still can't... What is the significance of gross floor area with regard to DCs? Um, so gross floor area is a proxy for demand. 
So in oh, effect, okay. it is demand. It represents demand. So 100 square metres of gross floor area is twice the demand of 50 square metres of floor area for any given um, sector. So um, it's like a Huey, okay. Uh, as far as a house goes, so it is the unit of demand effectively. So that's how you assess how many tra how many vehicle movements there will be. That's how you assess the impact on stormwater. That's how you assess. Um, Okay, so if someone challenge, okay, so what are you asking to happen with gross floor area? You've just you're changing the definition. Is that right? So just taking out a, it's a basic, it's a, it's an artifact from um, the district plan, meaning that it um, it's borrowed definition from the district plan, which is common. We align our definitions yep. with district plan definitions where which we can. Which is sensible if you can. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what it means is. Um, where there's a, an incidental um, small uh, piece of canopy for something that is incidental to the principal activity, such as a courier van turning up from time to time with a bit of um, wind cover, that that can be excluded. The problem has been that... Sorry, I don't know what's wind cover. What, what do you mean by that? Oh, like a, like a little canopy, a roof over a, over a courier okay. window. So say you've got a great big um, logistics... Uh, we, um, warehouse sort of thing, and there are canopies over the, so there's the building, the stock, and then the trucks buck in, bu back into the building and there's a canopy over that, but there's no walls. Is that included or is that excluded now? Or does that not make any difference to this? Well, certainly it doesn't make any difference to the, um, that slight amendment we're proposing today. Um, that is a uh, gross floor area relating to the principal activity on the site, which would be logistics. In this case, we're saying that developers are either misusing or not understanding, but there, there's attempts to use the incidental uh, courier window to apply to large portions of canopy that are uh, covering logistics where activity happens. Mm. And so this is to be transparent um, to developers and vice versa. It's just, it's just a, a simple exclusion. And look, if you keep it in there, say, you you take the council decides not to take that out, then we'll just keep managing that through the assessment team and, and explaining um, what it is supposed to mean. But that just seems like a, an inferior outcome. So in a perfect world, and we're not in a perfect world, you, you, there, would, there would be some sort of digital way of counting how many vehicles come and go, how much stormwater gets in. But we use yep. these things as proxies, don't we? Use these as right. rough guesses of what's likely to happen. That's okay, right. so we would only do this if we couldn't get a more accurate, like do we fall back to this if we can't get a more accurate assessment? So a developer has the right to say, no, um, I know you think that's what's going to happen at my business, but because of certain aspects of the way I, I run my business, that's not going to happen, and then you go to a sort of bespoke um, remission. Rem yeah, yeah. The, okay. If you meet certain criteria, you enter the remission uh, assessment and, and then there's a process for that which is effectively you're of some scale and you can prove that you're using um, less demand and uh, that it has an impact on council's okay. infrastructure uh, programming and then yes you can be eligible for a remission. Okay so the problem with these things <clears throat> is often the the actual definition are you and look I'm asking you to praise your own way you know, critique your own work but are you comfortable that the, de the definition is clear and uh, and objective. You, do you mean the gross floor area definition as a whole? Uh, well, I'm not sure what I mean actually. <laughs> you, I mean you're starting to describe it as this was she, this shall be included because there's a a, um, a canopy or not a canopy or a, or a canvas or something like that. Uh, are those things objective enough that we can start charging people or not charging people? based on those definitions? So it's nuanced, and it needs you don't to want, be you, I mean, you, With all serious, I know, I know you're being careful. You don't want nuance. You want clear black and white definitions. The, the thing I think is, though, in policy, there you reach a level of specificity where it becomes problematic, where you start saying what a kitchen is and whether or not it yeah. has a microwave. That doesn't help. But then it's not useful just to say, you know, a room with a sink, because that might include other things. So you, think, it depends, really. So I'm going to be a little bit black and white on this. So basically, I think the um, uh, Appendix 1, if you look at the area that's been cut out, that gives the best example, which is, I don't know what page is that on. 
It's um, on page 11. Yep, um, 6.22. By, incidental... by, by including the term incidental or temporary loading and servicing areas in access there too, it provided for a degree of ambiguity between ourselves and the development community. We are trying to remove that because what we would do through this process is we would then say, well, wait a sec, this isn't incidental, this is part of your overall operation and having a canopy there is what you would do as if you're running your business. So we're trying to remove the ambiguity between the application of, they're saying uh, covering for a logistics warehouse which covers the entire truck so they can load it, they're saying that's incidental and it's not necessarily needed for the operation of their business. We're saying, wait a sec, no, it is actually needed for the operation of your business, it's not incidental, we need to have that and the, the gross ball area needs to be covered. In terms of before when you said is it a proxy for, there's actually some science that goes through behind the application. When the, if you get an engineer to come along and design a cover area, they will consider the, the square meterage, the coefficient of run out, runoff, the level of stormwater response you need, on-site storage, and the impact that has on the uh, network. So whilst it is a proxy, it is a scientifically founded proxy that actually delivers um, good engineering information. And then as a consequence, it makes sense when we apply it to a uh, DC point of view in terms of the impact or demand it has on the network. So okay. I think this is an improvement in the definition because it removes that ability for someone to challenge based on that Remove definition. Removes some ambiguity. It removes some ambiguity. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay, then um, paragraph 35. Uh, can you just explain the stuff that's italicised? Yeah, so this relates to a wet industry, which is defined as a development that uses more than 15,000 litres of water per day. So there's an objectivist measurement there, yep. Yeah, that's right. And um, so this was a, um, discussed at a remission that um, was brought to council regarding the spray dryer in um, oh, yeah. Innovation Park. Effectively, when you walk through that gate, meaning you do have uh, 15,000 litres of water or more, um, effectively the policy doesn't deal with that well, so it, in, in terms of Hueys, it's just at that level of scale, um, it needs to have um, a different lens put on it. So what that does is, that what this provision effectively says is when you walk through that gate, then you need to uh, have an agreement as to, and there needs to be analysis and metrics as to what water is used and what DC should pay. So this um, is... A very trivial, oh, it's a very trivial, very small amendment which effectively says it uh, directs you instead of from section 200 to section 200, 200 and, uh, to 207, sorry. 207 is a set of provisions around private developer agreements and the structure and, and the requirements that they need to have that was born in August 2014. That uh, reference that's in there, 202, is from a policy that was in 2013. So effectively the law changed, we need to redirect you to the correct uh, provision in the Local Government Act and that's it. Okay, so obviously these people will be water by metre people, aren't they? They would have to be. They must be. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, um, that, wait, but that point's not quite relevant in yeah, terms of this context, yeah, because ultimately we're looking at the future demand on our, well, that our demand on our network which at that point in time is an assessment based on whatever engineer they've recruited to do, to do the work and our assessment of that response. So in future we'll test that, but at this point in time it's based on future demand and so forth. So we haven't tested, we haven't calculated the water, it's not, a, it's not an actual measurement system at this point in time, it's an engineering assessment. So the engineering assessment is based on the increased demand that this will put on our network? Yes, that's correct. Okay, thank you. Is moved by myself, seconded by the Deputy Mayor. Councillor Angela. Mayor Andrew. Um, look, you can't create good policy with bad information, and this is what has happened here. Um, we have made a mistake. Mistakes happen, but this is a significant one. It's a serious one. There are more options than what is available uh, here in the paper, and I would have liked to have had an opportunity to explore those options. Um, anything can be changed from an LTP budget at any time, and we haven't been given those options. Sending out an email to the development community at the 11th hour yesterday is not keeping the development community informed. And some of my colleagues around the table will have received numerous emails, as I did, from the com development community last night, who are very upset by this latest surprise, and I don't blame them. 
This is another slap in the face for our investors to a city that creates even more uncertainty, even more uncertainty that will drive investment away. And the very next report is uh, another example of what will drive investment away. Look, I am opposed to the development contributions policy. I was throughout the LTP, and we are seeing the consequences of bad policy that was rushed through. Uh, as we heard from the CEO, the LTP process was, uh, was a challenging process. It went quick. We were under time pressure. And the consequence of that is bad, bad, bad policy. So I will not be voting for this. Deputy Mayor Martin. Uh, thank you. I, I think I have received, to the best of my knowledge, one piece of correspondence from the Property Council of New Zealand. I can't seem to get the attachment that it alludes to, and I do acknowledge that correspondence. However, the critical uh, thing for this recommendation at this point is um, preparing a proposed development contributions policy for public consultation. Uh, and that will be, in my view, good public consultation. Better public consultation than when we sold off our pension houses all those years ago. I hope this is going to be meaningful uh, consultation, and I would certainly expect the Property Council and other investors to be absolutely given uh, a complete uh, adequate time, not just a three-minute submission. You know, I think this is really crucial that we do have uh, correct um, interactions and interventions. Uh, in the end, um, it's the issue of who picks up the bill. Who picks up the bill? How is that bill picked up for the ongoing development of our city? So you can have the low-income household of Dinsdale and Frankton picking up the bill unfairly, or you can, have, you can attempt to, to get a fairer way of picking up that bill. And I know this is a really uh, difficult, challenging process by, to get the levers right, to get the balances right, to, to encourage investment, but at the same time make sure that the costs fa fall uh, where they should. So I'm going to be listening very, very closely to all the submissions and obviously very, very respectfully uh, to the Property Council and others and ordinary mum and dad ratepayers, obviously, as well. Where should the bill apply? How do we apply it? Councillor Paula. Thank you, Mayor Andrew. Um, I support some of the comments made uh, previous to me. Um, it ha mistakes happen, but this was a very costly error, a very costly error indeed. And um, I'll just uh, support the comments that we went through a very rushed LTP. It was very hard on the decision makers, councillors, but it was equally hard on staff with 12-hour days and, this, and the like pushing through big financial decisions at 10 o'clock at night doesn't necessarily help anyone. Um, but I, I note that in response to Councillor Hamilton's questions, you noted that DCs have doubled since the new policy came into effect. So the development uh, community have had to absorb some uh, quite hefty changes. Um, I'm a bit confused about, I was a bit confused about the way the staff recommendation is worded because I know that now, having listened fully to the debate, what you're asking us to do is to approve a consultation document. But the way that this is worded with the approve at the end of the sentence, it sounds like we're approving A, B, C and D and consulting on them, which gives a slightly different weight to the recommendation in my view, um, because I um, am very keen to get feedback from the development community on this. I was in uh, Wellington at the Policy Advisory Group. Uh, Hi, Paula. I'm your assistant, here to help sorry. you. <laughs> I put my elbow on it. <laughs> Apologies for that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Put, we'll be more careful where I put my elbows. Um, uh, I was in a, a policy advisory group in Wellington yesterday and we were talking about the housing crisis that most people there consider has got worse, not better in uh, New Zealand and in the metro areas. And uh, we were talking about the levers that we can apply to get construction happening more quickly. Um, so it's very disappointing to see here we are, uh, have made a mistake 
that might put the anchors on a few developers instead of encouraging them to go forward. So, but look, we do have to go out with something. We do have to acknowledge our mistake as a genuine mistake without casting long-term blame on anyone and look for the solution here. But I'm absolutely keen that we're as open as possible when we went, go out to the community. And as I say, I'm not terribly happy with the way that the recommendation is worded because I kind of read it a little bit differently. When I read it, I thought, you're asking me to approve this and then take it out. Well, actually, you're asking me to to um, approve a document to go out, and I think the wording was a little bit unusual. But that's my view. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Rob. Thank you, Chair. Look, mistakes do happen. Uh, it's a pity that the mistake in this case is a significant amount, but I do um, acknowledge that uh, staff have been very, very open about this today. What I would like to see, and I think it echoes the comments of the uh, earlier speakers in the debate is that we need to be as open as possible in our public consultation on this matter. And it may mean that we may need to suggest what the alternatives are. Um, certainly there is uh, a fair bit of angst amongst the development community already on reports five and six. And I think there is a, a marrying of the two reports when it, when it will come to public consultation. So I would ask that um, staff and the governance group have some uh, cognizance of that. Um, this is important, it's public money, it's important that uh, we do keep our, our finances, uh, our books balanced, and, uh, and given the significance of this, we need to move forward in terms of making sure that we are meeting our objective of, of growth, paying, paying for growth. Um, so the mistake has happened, but let's move forward with better, better systems and let's be open to our community in terms of how we might deal with this mistake and, and what the other options might be that they may be um, prepared to consider and we may be prepared to consider um, as we make amends to this. Thank you. Um, I'll support the recommendation because it is a consultation document. Um, there are obviously some pro um, problems we've got. They have to be fixed. Um, but the problems are, seem to be both in our policy, where, where I think there are items that our, the developers are telling us don't work. But um, I'm also concerned that there seem to be some, er um, uh, some errors or some faults in our processes. Like, you know, this is a, just a simple, the, the big money era here was uh, something that should have been picked up, I would have thought, in a reconciliation process or some sort of QA process. Um, so everyone's uh, agreed that uh, mistakes can happen, uh, but they shouldn't. And I would have thought we had um, checks and balances that uh, hopefully would have ensured they didn't occur. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Andrew. Uh, look, <laughs> I, I, I have the same sentiments. Mistakes happen and we have to fix them up, but um, it just sounded to me like there's, there's just a little tick in a box and then it just all goes haywire. Where else are we, are we having boxes that we tick that something else will happen? And that frightens me a little bit. And, and who has to pay for that? Um, <laughs> the developers, I was against uh, the DC policy as well and um, I will vote against it because um, I'm glad that Councillor Leary dug deeper into this area because I was a bit frightened when I read it and I didn't, it was very unclear that for me as well, the, um, the whole report. And I, I am looking for more simple reports as well because I mean, <laughs> what are we going out to people to? If we, if we don't understand it properly, how can the people out there understand it properly? So it's just a lot more clarity. I mean, the, and, um, and, finding out that this is quite a huge error. Um, and I get it, the staff has been under major pressure. I totally understand that. And it has been a tough 10-year um, plan, and I get that all. But um, making a, a mistake like that is, is, ma is massive. And, um, and I, just, I just hope we don't have any other boxes that we're ticking that have got major consequences for our ratepayers. So, um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, look, I just need to reframe this debate a little bit. It's um, 
to me, it, it's, it's quite clear we're being asked to approve the preparation of a document for public consultation. Now, if you vote against that, I would assume that you're voting for the status quo. So all those things we say about um, mistakes happen and what a terrible mistake it was, you're actually voting not to go out and invite discussion on the thing. So I'll be supporting this motion. Um, so I don't... Um, I'm not comfortable and I don't like the beating up of stuff that's happened during this debate and during this question times. Uh, it's not on. Um, they're our staff and they're good staff. Um, Greg, I commend you and your team for finding this mistake. Thank you. I commend you for finding this mistake and putting it oh, right and for ticking the box. Well done. And I want to remind elected members that if this doesn't go through, there will have to be a rates increase to cover the money. It's as simple as that, because this is a part of the 10-year plan that has flowed through. Sorry, point of order, that's Correct. What's your point of order? Point of order is fact, factual correctedness. On what statement? On what you just said. Exactly. What, what part of the statement? You said that if this doesn't go through, it'll be forced onto ratepayers. It's factually incorrect. I'd like somebody to I'll rule on hand that. hand it over to the... Um, so to it's include, our 10-year plan programme is fully funded and therefore it is already reflected in our rates increase. So it won't be another increase. Mm. If This will take the burden off the ratepayers if the resolution goes through, effectively switching the funding from rates, which it currently is, to development contributions. Yep. Our 10-year plan is fully funded, either by rates... <coughs> to debt or development contributions to debt. <laughs> to different developers well, that, other than going on to rate passes, is that what you're saying? At the moment, the 10-year plan is premised on our, ten -year, our capital programme be funded by debt and that repayment, in this case, being made by rates. If you uh, go out to consultation and approve ultimately the change in policy, rather than this programme being f um, paid for back by rate payers, it will be paid back by developers. Okay. Thank you. So I want to remind elected members that this report has been in circulation since Wednesday last week and there's been every opportunity to come and clarify and talk with staff if they had concerns about this. And in, in that way we would have been, you would have been far more informed in where you've gone today instead of doing this in such a public way. It could have been done, it could have still been brought up now, but it could have been talked over in depth with staff beforehand. I fully accept that the developers, the investors and the business owners risk all to build their city. But they've also got to pay their way. They make profit and they've got to pay their way. And if the, de if the developers, investors and business owners aren't paying their way, then the ratepayers of the city have to pick it up. And that's not the foundation that we built a 10-year plan on. We built it on growth paying for growth. I want to finish by reminding elected members that if you never stand behind anything and you constant, constantly vote things down, you'll never be wrong. Let's go to the vote. The motion is carried 9 4 2 against. Okay, we'll move on to item six. Um, thank you, Greg Carson. Uh, I'll just get you to introduce Lockman. Sure. Uh, good morning again. Um, I'd just like to introduce um, Lachlan Muldowney, um, barrister, who will be supporting me on this item. Um, so this item number six, funding growth infrastructure options report. Um, this, I'm bringing this report back to council as requested on the 4th of December finance committee. Um, there has been uh, quite a bit of discussion about this, so I think I just need to quickly sort of distill it down to its um, key components. Um, when we talk about development contributions, 
um, typically the council will um, use its opportunity at a resource consent stage to collect development contributions. Um, this report is, but ha notwithstanding that council has the opportunity to use any of its triggers available to it under the Local Government Act. Um, this report is, comes back to council to provide options, but also to um, provide some clarification for councillors around under what um, considerations staff would give to an assessment of development contributions as to whether it might select one of its other options other than resource consent. Um, and I guess the, the final point on this is that this, this is a, about policy application and guidance, so it, it relates to the entire city. It relates to uh, anything from, a, um, potentially from a, a, the subdivision of a backyard all the way through to a, a very large um, development. Um, and then it suggests some criteria that should be looked at um, in determining where the council should move away from what is just its preferred option, not what it is uh, required to do, just to another option that it has. Um, so I hope that clarifies it a bit. I know it can get, um, it's, it's a, can get quite complicated, this um, particular thing. Um, but I'll just leave it there and um, I'll take questions. Councillor Angela. Thanks, thanks, Greg. So this, um, uh, during the LTP, I mean, this is, this is a consequence of what we baked into the LTP between the impact of, of the decision between the new, the old DC policy and the new vol DC policy. We baked into that process a 30% allowance for, th for this consequence. Was that not enough or did we forget to put that 30% in? So it was not factored in to the, to the revenue projections? Well, when we, when we, sorry, in which are you referring to? What, which, so which we 30%? baked an allowance, in the, we baked an allowance of 30% for DC revenue, anticipating that there would be a rush of consents, and we would miss out on some revenue. We had a conversation about that. We reported on that. We baked. We, I thought we baked in a 30% allowance for the consequence of that policy. Did we not do that? And that's why all oh, suddenly there's a gap in funding. Um, I'll just defer to my modeler, Nathan. 30% adjustment for, what was it again, Councillor O'Leary? Look, I, I just remember the report saying, and we had a conversation saying that we were going, one of the financial risks of a new policy was that, who am I looking at? Oh, sorry, was, no, no, no. Was that, peop, uh, was that, we, we had several conversations in this chamber around um, what's the consequence if we put in a new policy that ratchets up the development contributions by significant amounts in certain areas, what is the risk, and even the lawyer was present at one point to say we could manage it if we baked in a 30% allowance for everyone rushing in before 1 July 2018 when the new policy kicked in. We had lots of conversations about that. So it is. So the thirty percent was just our was what we thought the consequence citywide might be, and that is is that looking okay? Are we kind of on budget with that? Was that a, a right? A number? Okay. And, and just to make this clear that it's um, not focused on um, Peacock or any particular development. There are some large developments. He said it was. Yeah, you know, he did say that. There are some large individual developments that are probably unique in their size, including uh, Peacocks, but there's other ones in the city that will impact on this in terms of greater than the average in terms of that 30% sucked up. So. So is it or is it not? So 30% was it, built in there, but there's some large yeah. developments that, are, uh, that happen that were more significant that 30% that that, can suck up. It's it. They, they, they rushed in mm. under the old policy and said, we're going we're gonna to get in here early, and that was... So we would have been better if we'd tried to... And I know it's crystal ball gazing. 30% was crystal ball gazing. But now the report is here saying we did, it wasn't quite enough because there, 
because there were some very large developments that jumped in early on the policy. Is that right? Yeah, I think there's a, a philo philosophical argument to go here, and I'm waiting for Gary to tell me off, um, is in terms of um, challenging the way we apply what is actually allowable within the policy. Mm. And the policy allows us to take or to reflect the demand on our network at various mm. stages. Yeah. And when we premise, and our practice has been to take the DCs at the basic land use consent stage, or the resource consent stage, sorry, and <coughs> that practice has meant that um, there would be a, a certain degree of revenue in the city, and that 30% was identified that rather than changing our practice, we could just basically absorb that 30%. Mm. Um, what, the, what the policy also says is that we should actually consider broadly what the other triggers are for collecting DCs. In the case of large-scale developments, the, rather than just absorbing it, we should actually give them the size of it, and all, um, at that point, all these uh, resource consents that are coming in question whether or not we're taking it at a different stage. And the policy allows us to do that. So I've been challenging my team about whether or not a gap exists or not. Yeah. Well, it wasn't a gap, a financial gap. It was actually a practice that we've been doing for such a per long period of time and challenging whether or not that practice should be challenged again. And some of the development that's happening in the city has given us rise to challenge that practice. So we normally, as practice <coughs> under our policy, yes. our current DC policy, um, normally charge on resource consent. That's correct. But uh, as, as, a, as a practice, our, our policy yeah. allows three triggers, but as a practice, we've been doing that because, to be fair, the steps between multiple policies over multiple years mm. have not been as significant. As growth mm. has increased and the nature of development has changed, it's mm. given us cause now to question whether or not we should actually look for the other triggers within the policy and use that to apply in these circumstances. Um, and also, because along the way, whether it's resource consent, um, um, code of compliance, code of compliance connection. service connection, yep. um, Whichever point in time of a development where we go in and where we say, right, we're sending you an invoice for DCs, if then the development changes over that time, we're still monitoring and we're still able to invoice again if there is any gap. So that's yeah. correct, uh, isn't no, it? No, so I might let Lachlan answer is this Is that one. not correct? It is. If there is a, an identified change in demand that was modelled when you first assessed the DCs, yeah. So you, you do get to continue to levy DCs during the life of a development, but only where you can identify changes in the expected demand on the network. Yeah, yep. okay. And that, that comment, expected demand on the network, is the critical point you need to consider here. So what we're trying to do is match the demand that's been placed on the network to the responding infrastructure we need to invest to meet that demand. Mm. And that's where the gap's happening. Well, that's where there's a, 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 a difference in that if you put in a resource consent under an old policy, for a development that's going to draw on a la far larger area of capital investment that's required to deliver that demand, but that, that far greater capital expenditure hasn't been included until the future DC policy, there's a, there's a discrepancy. So yeah. it's really the best term here is rather than gap is matching, yeah. you know, in terms of what we're trying to achieve. Yeah. Um, just on page 17, under point 31, um, I wonder the options is that we could levy a targeted rate. What? Quantum would it roughly? What quantum would that targeted rate look like per dwelling? Because I'm assuming it would be a targeted rate on the homeowner in the end. Yeah, because council has quite wide discretion as to how it deploys yeah. that targeted rate. You could say the difference between having a targeted rate over eight years versus 30 years um, makes a substantial difference. So. We did a whole variety of, um, we looked at a bunch of generic options and say for a gap of say $30 million over, um, I say $15 million over 500 sections, you might look at somewhere between 1,200 and 3,500 per section per year. But I mean, there are so many options available, there are so many ways to structure it that it's a bit, sort of a bit, it doesn't really add much to, to make an estimate like that. Yeah, and your recommendation is option one in the report, isn't it? That's correct. Yeah. And that's just council exercising its um, available options under the Local Government Act. So it already is an option, it's just a, yeah. a case of highlighting that yeah. given the discussion, really distilling the discussion to that point. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, am I correct in assuming if we do adopt option one and read on table on 
uh, under power of 25, there will be a delay in the receipt of development contributions from the present way that we, re we receive them currently when the section is titled. So there may be a further delay if we're waiting for connection or code of, uh, sorry, building compliance. Yeah, so it's a later stage in the development um, process and, and therefore the DCs will be received at a, you know, correspondingly later period. So have we factored that into our 10-year plan calculations and into the annual plan calculations that we'll be looking, assuming option one is accepted, have we already programmed that in? Because I assume that there could be a one or two year delay in the receipt of DCs if option one is adopted compared with how we actually receive them at, at the present time. Um, through the chair, so the plan is, depending on which option is adopted today, we will model that and bring it back at the next round of the annual plan and show that through the 10-year uh, plan as well. So you'll be able to see that in the Finance Committee as well through the Financial Strategy Monitoring Report. So uh, that will be for this annual plan? That yes, we, yes, okay, absolutely. But it's not in the predictions that we're looking at in the next report? That's right. Okay, okay. Um, what, noting, noting that the annual plan that we'll go through later on today is just um, the first yeah, step pre in a, a number of yep. meetings that we will have um, with elected members in terms of building the, um, the final annual plan. So Do you so predict that there will be a significant shift in the revenues from what we might expect in 20 uh, and 21? I haven't, I haven't done that piece of work with Greg, but I will do it following. following. Just, just a hunch? Have you got a hunch as to whether it might be... I know well, we, have, we, have, we, have three choices, books, we have three choices in which to strike um, the requirement to pay DC, so yep. that means that we're not shifting everything to... Um, well, we're just highlighting the fact that we have that option available for this large development. Um, we, yeah, you know, we cash, cash earlier is better for council, of course, because we um, can pay down debt and we don't yeah. get interest charges. So yep. um, I th think what this paper is doing is flagging to elected members that, um, depending on the circumstance, will choose either. Yeah, and just just to be aware that the um, when uh, uh, Mr Carson did the briefing on this, we indicated to council it would probably be a deferral of about one to two years gap between when the DCs would have been taken prior, prior to when they will be taken. So it's a one to two year gap. So the consideration here is the impact that has on shifting from a debt capacity perspective yep. more than anything. So it's a timing issue. Yep. Um, from a, uh, from a development, developer point of view, it shifts in the cycle to potentially being the, the, the builders that pay the DCs rather than the developer paying the DCs. So yep. it's, a, it's a different cycle for them, but for us it's one to two years. Yeah, okay. So, Councillor, just just to add to that, the the present value is zero across the um, yeah, you yeah. know the, the net present value difference between the code of compliance and the resource consent yep. option is nil. So you will you may see you will see a shift in the the mix, I guess, in the later part of the the ten year plan. Yep. Um, but because the DC model has an interest component yep. which is relates to the debt, the net present value difference is zero. Yeah, thanks for that. I'm just looking to, or trying to visualise how our financial statements might look uh, as, they, as we've got them projected in the 10-year plan and how they might look if we've got significant amounts of revenue moving from, if you like, 20 into 21 and 22. Um, there, there's a bigger impact, um, Councillor Pascoe, if we shift to a targeted rate aspect because we're, push, yeah, we're, we're, um, we're picking up the DCs over, over a fast, yeah. tighter period, regardless yeah. whether it's at um, yep. Resource consent or code of compliance under targeted rate, it spreads it out over potentially up to, like yep. um, Greg said, eight to 30 years yep. um, as you try to manage that amount. Um, and that changes our uh, debt profiling significantly. Yep, understand that. Second question is around public consultation, which is what I raised mm -hmm. in, in the first, uh, in, in item five. I'm just a little bit concerned here that given we have more stakeholders involved in option one, or will have going forward um, and the potential angst and whether there's proof that developers will take the DC component off the price of the section and all of those things. Um, why we are not considering, given that in item five we're going to public consultation on a change to the DC policy, why we're not wrapping this in 
into also public consultation so we have an opportunity for feedback uh, from the community as to whether they like option one or would prefer a targeted rate or any other option going forward. This sort of smacks a little bit of um, you know, a decision that we're making because we have got the statutory uh, power to do it, but we're not really extending out to our community to see whether or not they feel it's appropriate, uh, an appropriate way of collecting those DCs. Um, the, the short answer is, and it's and part of the answer is in the, the way that you framed the question, council has the right to do this under the Local Government Act. So the, the, the law is very clear on your ability to select your milestone for acquiring a DC. And um, the, 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 the answer to the consultation question is really that there is no change to your current policy that is being suggested in this paper. In fact, um, this is a paper which is looking for some guidance from the council as to how to apply its current policy position. And to, to illustrate the point, if I can take um, uh, you, Councillor Pascoe, to paragraph 28 of the report. Um, that's a paragraph which um, contains excerpts from your current policy. <coughs> um, and it's, it refers to, at, at 10.4, it says, Council at its sole discretion will determine at and which of the milestones set out in clauses 10.2 and 10.3 that will require development contributions. 10.2 and 10.3 refer to the three milestones um, that we've talked about. Um, and then it goes on to say that unless, in Council's view, there is good reason, Council will require a development contribution to be paid at the earliest milestone. But then 10.5 moves on to say that if Council elects not to require a development contribution at the earliest of the milestones, it reserves the right to require a development contribution at any subsequent milestone, regardless of whether the assessed DC charge at that subsequent milestone is higher or lower. So what I would say to you is that you already have a policy position which acknowledges that you will um, send a signal to the development community that we take the DCs at the earliest available opportunity as a general proposition, but we've reserved the right to go to later um, milestones if there is good reason, and that's the, that's the language that's, that's contained within um, policy 10.4. And so really what this paper is, is doing is coming back to council and saying, we want a bit of guidance, or staff wants a bit of guidance as to what good reason is. What is a good reason to move from an early milestone to a later milestone? And resolution uh, B in the paper, which is at paragraph um, 4B, um, really captures the thinking by saying, um, well, if we are to exercise that discretion under clause 10.4 of the policy to go to a later milestone for good reason, here's some criteria that staff like Greg can apply um, with some level of confidence that it fits within the, the, the intentions of the policy makers. And so really all the paper is trying to do is take the existing policy position and get a little more guidance as to how it's to be applied. So that means that there's not a shift in policy, there's not a change in policy, there's just a bit of guidance being sought here. So without a shift in policy and without a change in policy, there is no obligation to go out and consult yep. with the community in the formal sense. Understand that. I'm just perhaps my question should have been better framed to the extent, and perhaps I ask you this as a ratepayer in the city: Is it? Do you think it's good practice that we are simply relying on our policy, which gives us um, a unilateral way of changing the way that we might collect and who we might collect the DCs from? Um, do you think it's good practice that we decide on that without consulting back to our community? Well, again, what I would say in answer to that is that the, from a ratepayer perspective, what this option is seeking to achieve is a level of revenue associated with the DC stream, um, which has been predicted and modelled as part of your long-term planning and your annual planning, um, which has the opposite effect, which means that rates are being kept where everyone expected them. So option one really represents, from a ratepayer perspective, a status quo. It means rates are not bearing the burden 
of any kind of funding gap or funding deficit. So you're not letting the deficit arise in the first place, mm. so the rates are being kept as they are. Thank you. Thank you. Um, have, sort of going on from this, has any analysis been done on the impact of development if different processes, different uh, DC policies are applied? There might, there, as with all of these things, there's a level at which um, the DCs are just too expensive. And, and that, might be, that might be sending a good signal to us, telling us you've got a bit of really crappy land here that just can't be developed. It's just so expensive. So the, across the city, and the, there's all nature of developments and they're assessed at resource consent, land use consent, building consent, code of compliance. Uh, there's a building um, you know, certificate that we can also charge against. So, you know, there's a lot going on in terms of when and what and why, you know, developments are charged. What we're really talking about here is sort of a, a very unusual situation where DCs have gone up substantially. There's, um, you know, a, a, like new funded growth sales or major assets that are, have come into play. So um, the short answer is no, there haven't, hasn't been analysis of that sort, um, but I don't know how, necessarily how to isolate that. But I think if the DC liability falls upon you in year X and now it falls upon you in year X plus two, then in the scheme of land development and how people trickle their sections out and the, you know, the length and terms of development, like I would say, um, I don't know, but I would say that washes out. If you're talking about which party um, is going to pay the development contribution, then that does change. Mm. Um, but I guess that that's kind of a that's perhaps a little bit separate to your question. So the, the short answer is, I'd say in the aggregate, it doesn't uh, make a difference um, at a high level. Um, but then separately, it may cha change who pays the development contribution. Okay, um, we've discussed previously. Uh, we've had some briefings and whatnot about targeted rates. Um, and I read somewhere in here that there are some limits to targeted rates, and I can't find exactly where it was. I think it might have been in the grid, in the um, paragraph 25, somewhere along the line, there's something about... Uh, anyway, um, are, there, are there any limits to what, what the, the use of targeted rates? That they can't be... There's no limit that they must be less than a percentage of the entire rate or something like that? No, so my uh, yeah, look. I'm not a rating expert, um, but we 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 progressed that option to to understand what it meant. Um, there was some questions, and I'm probably that's what I'm referring to in the report about whether how whether or not you can charge or how successfully you can charge, say, a citywide recovery of a development contribution because the whole city, um, you know, would be liable for that. And if you're just targeting rates, say, a greenfield area, then. That was just one of the question marks where we weren't sure that that would just be a straightforward full recovery. Um, Richard? Yeah, so basically um, in itself targeted rates are very flexible. Uh, we can use them for, uh, there's a number of matters we can charge against and we can use them um, a, across the entire city or in various geograph geographical areas or whatever trigger you can reasonably identify. Um, the limitations with targeted rates are they set every year, whereas with, and well DC policies are to an extent as well. Um, but the DC policy has got to be based on the actual capital costs and present value and all that. So there's like a fixed mandate to it. Um, targeted rates, the elected members can bring what they consider a degree of fairness into that calculation, so it can vary every year. There's less certainty. Um, the other aspect to um, targeted rates is by moving to targeted rates, it, uh, like I mentioned before in response to Councillor Pascoe's question, it spreads the return of those assets across a longer period of time and may well change our revenue flow to an extent that it impacts on our debt to revenue ratio as well. So that's another consideration. Targeted rates can still be set on property value. Yes, but, that's right. But, we, and we do, we do that at the moment. Just, sorry? We do that at the moment. Our transitional rate to capital value oh, okay, is, yeah, is, yeah, is correct, the, the correct. Um, land value exactly, portion yeah, is, a, is, yeah. a, is a targeted rate. But, but, but I guess I mean a targeted rate to pay for the Pukiti upgrade or something like that. Um, if, if there was one sp specific suburb which was causing uh, the development of a road or the building of a bridge or something like that and was felt unfair that the rest of the community pays for it because the, that local community is getting 100% or 80% of the um, value of it, um, you could do you could target a rate to that degree of specificity. You can, you can put a target rate to that. 
the yeah. extent to which you can be challenged, um, there is still risk of challenge. If it could be argued that council didn't consider all the factors, like any any due yep. process aspect, the right information wasn't provided, it's unfair because with the DC policy, we're required to assess the impact of who basically benefits from yep. that development. And I was going to say that that's a process you guys have to go through and justify uh, anyway, but, don't but you? It's, absolute, it's absolutely yeah, ro yeah. robust and dictated by legislation. There's no such requirement in the rating act to do that for rates because there's a, ultimately a degree. When it comes down to it, you've got a rating pie, you're dividing down by some denominator to determine what the rates are. Okay. What, um, one of the things that concerns me is um, whatever we come up with here, someone's going to have to pay for it, um, or, or we, we slow down our capital development program or, or something like that, and we make some changes to that, um, is the degree that we can make sure that whoever is going to get paid, has to pay for it, will get visibility, and that will be ultimately the purchaser of the property pays for it or otherwise your developer's gone bust or something along the process along the line but generally um, all other things being equal and if the development is successful the property owner pays for it um, and that's okay if it's a DC which has been factored at any one of these stages although I did I've got some um, third party uh, intervention uh, talking about um, owners of properties being billed for DCs. Is that possible? Um, Sorry, when I say an owner developed. of a property, the, yeah, yeah, the, yeah, the, the ultimate purchaser. So generally if it's a um, Murrumpa building on a section, they could well pay oh, for okay. it. Okay, but, they are the, but they're the they're, developer. They're, developer. they're, well, the, developer, they're, the, they're they? the builder. The developer is likely to be the person that developed the subdivision. Then you've got the builders that come along and buy the sections off yep. the developer. Okay. In this case, the scenario is if we take the code of compliance stage or the connection stage, the builder will pay. They, it probably doesn't change anything from the ultimate purchaser mm. of that property. It might change their um, progress payments against the purchasing of the house, but I doubt it, because ultimately the price of the section and a few days later, the, 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 the code of, well, a few years later, code of compliance, but it's, mm -hmm. that will be a consideration. Okay, the service connection is the point at which you're allowed to live in a house, is that right? Um, service connection is, I think, simply where you connect to council services, so where you connect your water um, service to the city's network. So that doesn't imply that the house is built yet? Often for like non-residential, people need it to clean their sites and wash down the earthworks. Um, for residential, um, they, sometimes they get it before title, sometimes they want service connection after title, so there's, it's less predictable probably than the other triggers. So I guess my point is this, this transparency thing, that, that someone can't walk into purchasing a property not knowing that there's $50,000 worth of DCs hanging over them which a shifty developer may not advise, not that developers are shifty, but a, that a developer might not give you visibility on that. Um, it will be recorded on the limb. So we will do, we take every step we can to ensure that if a decision is made to progress on this track, that A, there's a degree of communication, B, that the right uh, mechanisms are used to record that liability um, in the future against the um, title as an outstanding DC. So that'll be the process that will be in place. Okay, on page uh, on paragraph on page fourteen, paragraph twenty one, there's a reference to Rotokauri and the Swales, etc. And there's some sort of uh, general discussion about third party funding and all that sort of carry on. What was the purpose of that being in there? Is it just saying that's an option that is available? Is it? Oh, I think it's just noteworthy. Um, you know, that, that's a $128 million um, yep. piece of infrastructure in a greenfield cell, um, and it's, it's relevant um, to the fact that we're talking about uh, the transition from cells with, without major infrastructure to major infrastructure. There's also, um, as I think, we're, as is well known, um, there are challenges in, in Rotokauri, and the government has uh, introduced some options around alternative funding and... Um, you know, developers have expressed at least some interest in, in engaging um, and trying to understand how those work. So it's just sort of, it's just a statement to yeah. say that. It, There's no magic that's in the that. Case. I mean, I mean, that's that. Just because council doesn't own that asset, there will be some. The third party will presumably pay for it and expect to be 
reimbursed for it over time through some process yes. of, of targeted yeah. rating or yeah. bonds or something like that. So, Someone okay. always pays Councillor Mallet. Yeah, yeah. But I guess okay. the relevance is that if it's not on Council's balance sheet, the, the Council can't charge development contributions for it. Yeah. So that's relevant to... But the developer, him, him or herself, will still be paying someone for those... That, someone. Yeah, yeah yes. something or some entity. Yeah. So it doesn't... Yeah. OK. Mayor Andrew, just a couple of quick questions, if I may. Um, on page 15 in the options box, um, you say public consultation is not required. Ha has this been socialised or discussed with the development community at all? At all? It has, hasn't it? Correct. I've socialised it with my networks, but that's uh, limited to large-scale developers. Um, I'm working on the basis that um, we're simply applying the policy as it's written. It explicitly allows us to consider which option. Um, so at this stage, I haven't engaged personally, or as a council, we haven't engaged in specifically on this topic okay. as, a, in, in the, as a public consultation. But there will be a communication program, though, to make sure that the community are aware of how our development contribution policy works. And that's just something we should do on a regular basis. There's a degree of, how would you put it, um, and it goes back to the previous paper, there's a degree of um, uh, myth behind development contributions and how they, how they work and how they're set and so forth. And we've spent a lot of time over the last f five years, five, years, five years trying to clarify those myths. So I think we just need to continue to do that, um, Councillor Paula, <laughs> including this point as well. Thank you. I take some comfort that it won't be a complete surprise to the development community. Uh, it's been in our policy for a number of years, so it's not a complete surprise to anybody, um, but yeah. Yep. So, so what I got from what Lachlan said, can I just see if I got this correctly? So we can do this legally, it's already there, and it's already allowed for. So what we're doing here is lifting this up into our DC policy to make it more explicit that that may be a preference. Okay. So the, the point is that it's already in the DC policy, so this it's option already is already there for you. There is already a policy position of council which signals that um, you will reserve a discretion um, to require DCs at a later milestone than resource consent um, if there is good reason to do so. And all the resolution is seeking from Council is um, a, a set of guiding principles, if you like, as to what constitutes good reason. And that is the the content of resolution B. Right, so, so that's the only bit that doesn't currently exist that... So yep. what we're attempting to do is to be quite clear about what might trigger that later yep. collection. And, and I think what's important is that we're not talking about a change in policy. If there was a change in policy, it would require consultation, as councillors have identified. All we're talking about is saying you've got an existing policy which talks about good reason to, to not levy at the first available opportunity for staff to have some level of confidence and comfort as to how they then administer your policy position, we're looking for, or they are looking for some guidance, which is what Resolution B is giving Greg. So ultimately, we have a practice that we've been following, and we've, been, we've identified that some of the circumstances behind um, in, in the community in terms of our development contribution policy are changing. We're flagging to Council that we're going to be testing our, our practice and applying a different mechanism as allowed for by the policy, and that has repercussions, which we're now reporting to you. Yeah, that's that's what I want clarity on. I guess I hold the view that we should hold, have a no surprises policy with the development community in terms of what when we when and how we talk to them, talk with them, I should say. Um, just a couple of other quick questions in that that box on page 15. Um, it says uh, as an advantage it would improve builders' cash flow. So given what I already said about how um, the housing crisis is being perceived in Wellington at the moment, uh, would an improved builders' cash flow potentially lead to sooner development or sooner completion of subdivisions? Um, well, yeah, like, you know, it'll provide... Um, uh, Injection, a financial injection, uh, you know, of some on some level, which would could provide for faster development, uh, more development, quicker movement. I mean, what it means is that instead of if you pay it at resource consent, then the landowner pays it, but typically just passes it straight in their contract to the building company, just passes it straight to the building company. 
in, in the case of paying at code of compliance, it just means that throughout their build, they've probably got uh, some additional access to funding because they haven't paid it yet. So it's an advantage, but <coughs> it's probably a somewhat short-lived advantage. Um, I wouldn't say that it's a major financial uh, you know, benefit, mm. but it's of some benefit. I just want to be um, um, assured that this is something that um, encourages sooner development rather than um, stands against sooner. Because we're trying to promote development in the city as quickly as possible, aren't we? Yep. I mean, so what you're saying is that this could I'd be a little would, bit helpful, I'd, but it certainly I'd won't be I'd argue this will be neutral, to be fair. Be neutral? Yeah, um, mainly because most build well, large-scale builders may not, but most builders uh, get builders' terms. They borrow to buy, to buy the sections. Um, and then on top of that, they'll be borrowing to pay the DCs, whether it's included in the section or, you know, a bit down the track. So it's just a cost of financing argument. It won't impede it, um, Councillor O'Leary, uh, so Councillor Pat Southgate, it won't impede it. OK, that, thank you for that. Thanks, uh, thanks. Mr Mayor. Uh, just flowing on there from some of Councillor Paula's questions, would it be fair to say that this review of our discretionary ability to exercise was born out of the Peacock funding gap? Um, it was born out of the need to match um, the demand against the infrastructure requirements, so we, uh, which resulted in, if we applied the practice we're uh, applying, would have uh, would have resulted in a gap, not just on Peacocks across all of our city in terms of that, given the large step up in our DCs. But what we're trying to do is match the decision about when demand is triggered with the infrastructure that is required to deliver against that demand. Yeah, but that was a catalyst for this discussion, was it not? Absolutely. Um, but that we've had this conversation on micro level with a number of um, developers in the past, and we've even bought in PX, so I can't talk about it now, even bought um, papers back to council for this conversation um, uh, for approval of um, private development agreements that allow for different timing of collection of development contributions. So this is not unusual, and it's not unusual in terms of the application um, within um, uh, Greg's team to actually have these, these conversations. I think what is unusual is the level of growth that's occurring and the level of expenditure that's required to invest, and as a result, the level of capital expenditure that we need to borrow for, and that's the challenge here. And that results in a big gap if we don't get the, the triggers right. Yeah. Whilst we're not at risk of setting precedent because of our discretionary power, it would still be prudent, I'm sure, to manage your conversations skillfully. Um, as always. Um, and option 2.31, you just talk about re option 2, if we retain the status quo, will give rise to a future funding shortfall. Wasn't most of that funding shortfall, and I appreciate what you're saying about um, trying to align development with cost, but aren't we going to avoid a lot of that funding shortfall now, given that some of these issues were people lodging before we'd, we'd implemented that new policy? Well, yeah, absolutely. That's that's the purpose of the the um, recommended option one is to avoid the shortfall in the in the first place. So, um, you know, option two of retaining a status quo, if we continue to levy or require the development contributions on resource consent, um, the potential shortfall manifests and it needs to be addressed through some other means, like a targeted. Rate. But wasn't some of that shortfall because people were trying to lodge before the new DC policy, and that yep. no longer can can happen because it's yeah. yep. There was that, like I mentioned before, there's a certain level of understanding over DC policy. In all cases, it's not that well informed. And we've been running a practice, and because there's been seldom a huge difference in the DC charges, it's never been a consideration for us whether or not we needed to test that provision of collecting DCs at code of compliance. But given when we're shifting and the sheer level of growth, it has caused us to consider that. Cool, thank you. Richard, Greg, Lachlan. The explanation so far. Uh, Paul has already asked one of my questions about um, was there any consultation with the Property Council of New Zealand because we've all received, I think, that email from the Property Council voicing their concerns and some fears, I think. Um, so I'll go on to have you, um, Greg, have you noticed any change in developer attitudes or behaviours in regards to our DC policy? And, and by that I mean um, has development work changed in any way, uh, increased or decreased because of our DC policy? So we're undertaking that work. Uh, we've got a date to bring back to council um, with a briefing or a workshop to, to 
present sort of what information we can. We've got stakeholder um, or developer um, some meetings or workshops so we can try and understand um, what the effects are. I think obviously if your fees for anything go up by a mar significant margin, then there's going to immediately be sort of a reaction to that. Um, but separate to that, we want to understand sort of where it affects the, um, you know, the viability of developments or to what extent it affects choices, substitutes around where uh, alternatives might be. So um, we're, we're going to actually this work here has, has taken up um, my recent time, so that's kind of the next um, project which we've got a plan for. Um, and then, and then to, on the other side, we've got the numbers, so you can, you know, we can look at the level of development, where the development was, where the charges increased more or less. Um, that stuff, you can draw correlations, you can't be certain. Um, so I guess it, overall, we're going to bring that um, sort of group of findings back and, and try and draw some conclusions. Okay. And, and that's um, Councillor Casson is um, valuable information and it'll be value from information where we're setting our future development contributions policy in terms of whether or not we introduce CAPs or our, our program. In the context of this, our 10-year plan was premised about collecting the DCs at this high rate. And so the conversation that we had, and I think if we, you throw your minds back to the multiple thousands worth of pages of consultation document that you guys had to sift through, that probably gave a good indication from those developers of what they thought about the development contribution policy and the associated charges. And I think we've got a, a really strong level of feedback that, you know, more uh, increased DCs is a bad thing from their perspective. Mm -hmm. I can understand that. And, and going on from that, um, um, there seems to be, in my, in my opinion, a, a, bit of a, a bit of tension between uh, developers, Property Council, New Zealand and Council because of the DC policy. In your learned opinion, <laughs> um, have we got a relatively good working relationship with developers in our, in our community here, or is there is there tension? Yeah. Um, I want to make this. Um, some of my colleagues spend more time with developers. Um, my limited exposure to developers, we've got an exceptionally good working relationship with our development community. Um, like all relationships, um, there are areas where there is tension, um, and that tension sometimes extends beyond just the the quantum of. Um, uh, DCs, uh, it may well be the, the time constraints of processing consents and, and so forth, um, you know, and levels of service and, and, and so forth, but the premise and our engagement is very good. I'll hand over to the GM to add some flavour. Uh, so I would concur with what Richard just said in terms of the nature of the relationship um, means that we have uh, all manner of conversations, um, and some are straightforward and some are complex. Um, and some are, are comfortable and some are not comfortable. Um, and just to reiterate what Richard said in regard to the, the DC conversation has absolutely caused um, some challenges for them and some challenging conversations uh, for us to have with them. Um, equally to your point about the Property Council, uh, we, we have a, a positive working relationship with them. The uh, communication channels uh, for the Property Council executive um, and also the members in terms of landowners and developers. Uh, I mean, we're really open to having these conversations and, uh, you know, lots of the developers have got our, our contact details. So, you know, we, we are in these conversations all of the time. Um, yeah, does that answer okay. your question? Thank you. So it's an easier conversation than, say, the capital gains tax type thing. Yeah, it's uh, very similar in that respect. Hey, just you've got to remember, though, that if um, we don't have DCs, the ratepayer pays for it. So that's the, the split. So. It's, it's quite an interesting balance between having hard conversations with the development contribution versus having that hard conversation with your ratepayers. And that's the position that you lucky people get to sit in by trying to balance that up as much as you can. Thank you kindly. Yeah, j <coughs> Thanks, Chairman. And just to, uh, for my benefit, under option one, they go out and they get, um, they've got a section and then we send them a, an invoice, I presume, for the, for the DCs. Is that correct? Before they can start building. Well, it depends which uh, which option council. Yeah, under option to... one, this is. Sorry, under option one. Yep. Uh, option. So option one is the building consent That's option. Right. So building consent or service connection. So it would mean either mm -hmm. when they apply for a service connection or when they um, lodge a building consent. So they can still proceed with the building of the, pro of the, of the house, shall we say, without actually having paid the fee, is that correct? Yeah, so that it's assessed at building, when the building consent is lodged and then it's collected 
you must pay it prior to before we issue your code of compliance. Yeah. But you can still live in the property without a code of compliance, is that correct? I believe so. We did a bit of research around that. So Greenfield residential dwellings, it's highly, it, it's very rare that um, houses won't, um, you know, people won't seek code of compliance. So we asked around the banks um, and basically they won't provide the final tranche of funding unless you've got your code of compliance and likewise your insurance. So there's some pretty good, um, you know, stop gaps there from other parts of the industry. So if somebody's uh, mortgage free and they go and build their property, um, they could basically live there for the rest of their days without actually uh, paying for their code of compliance, can they? Yeah, assuming that they're wanting to try and um, not have insurance, I guess. But again, those that's probably on the very fine end of the stick in terms of, you know, mortgage-free people who don't want insurance. So I'd, hopefully um, that is in the margins. And the house becomes unsellable as well, um, Councillor yeah, Turner. Sure, sure. Yeah, so um, whilst it's an avenue, it's probably an avenue that exposes other risks to that homeowner. Can I just also add to that that there is an ability to effectively register a charge against the title for the unpaid DC, so that if that um, landowner ever decided to sell, um, that charge would need to be addressed before it could transfer to a new a new owner. Um, Richard, if we or Greg, if if. What would we get back with option two? Would that would you go away and have to do a whole lot of modelling given give us sort of a few examples on what a targeted rate might look like and then we would do that at a workshop? Um, I think um, depending where you land today, a degree of modelling is going to be required. Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, we can model just about anything to be honest with enough time. Uh, we do have some briefings coming up where we can provide some examples. Um, yeah. Kat, would you be comfortable, uh, I, I know there's no motion on the table yet, if, or would it be too much work um, to look at option one and option two? Uh, Work-wise, um, but like Richard said, it's, it's certainly doable. Um, depends, <laughs> I, I mean, we can do the modelling, I guess, uh, if there's a resolution where we can... Um, do the modelling. There'd need to be some, uh, I guess, examples. We'd need to choose examples and different catchments, hmm. um, and then go ahead under some um, uh, some hypothetical situations, I guess. Hmm. But the, in essence, the, uh, either way, whatever option a council asks you to look at, you're going to have to do a whole lot of modelling, and we, that will come to a briefing. So option one doesn't require any modelling. It's no. just an application hmm. of the policy. But okay. option two. Yes, that would require modelling. Plus, we'd need to make some assumptions around the legal and technical um, mm. things around about deploying a targeted rate, which Richard, yeah, he was talking about. Yeah. And, and, and the other avenues in terms of the targeted rate is um, absolutely have to look at the, the debt to revenue fund, uh, impacts and stuff like that, Council Leader, which I think that's what you're suggesting, mm. yeah, that, that mm. aspect of modelling as well. So there's the DC modelling, which the team up here deal with, and that gentleman there, but also David's team needs to do the financial strategy modelling like we do as part of the 10-year plan type discussion. And given under the policy you can choose now um, when to apply the DC, at what point, um, what, what's fundamentally the difference between what you're asking council to do in option one? Is it, is it the non-exhaust, uh, being, staff being able to apply that non-exhaustive criteria? Is that really the fundamental difference? Because you can do it now, you can charge it. That's service. right. Yep. I think just the the issue is significant. We we know that there's some significant dollars, um, and it's it's unique. Um, so yeah, whilst staff could um, go ahead and make their policy assessment, um, we just for transparency purposes wanted to bring it to council and show that here's our suggested list of criteria that we should consider in doing that, and just make sure that um, those were the appropriate type of considerations. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I've got some support from for Angela's um, position of looking at uh, option two as well. Um, presumably, if uh, we go out with, if we go to option one and it goes through the process, blah blah. Um, if there is no, and you've, you've Angela brought up the non-existent, non-exhaustive criteria and the good reasons and things like that, there's quite a bit of wiggle room 
in our policy here. So if um, there is not good reason or we've exhausted our criteria, um, the shortfall will just fall to the general ratepayer. Well, not necessarily. I mean, that's, that is one of the, the benefits of going with option one, is that if um, in assessing a particular development and working through that criteria, um, it's decided that um, it's better for whatever reason to require the DCs on resource consent and allow a shortfall to develop mm. in that particular development, mm. you could then always come back and um, uh, implement a targeted rate in that area to address that shortfall. So you, you still have that flexibility. If you adopt option one, you still have the flexibility. Where does it say that? Well, that it doesn't, but it's, mm. it's, um, you know, um, um, it's implicit in the sense that if you, if, you, if you adopt option one and you apply the criteria that, that um, has been identified in resolution two and you decide for whatever good reason, no, we're going to stick with resource consent, um, if that then manifests a funding shortfall, you will always have the opportunity to come back and think about how you address that shortfall. If you do absolutely nothing, it will fall to the general ratepayer. If you decide that's an unacceptable outcome, you would have the ability to come back and deal with a targeted rate for it. So option one actually doesn't count out the long-term solution of option two. Um, it, it, it would remain on the table for you. OK, why... Why wouldn't the recommendation then include that, just be overt and say um, any shortfall should be considered for a targeted rate or something like that? Well, I mean, it, it could. I mean, option one, the, the, the resolution could, could identify option one um, as, the, as the preferred option uh, and the recommendation for staff, and then it could say um, where in the exercise of the discretion uh, council determines not to levy on a later milestone and a shortfall arises, mm. um, council will reserve its right to, to look at a targeted rate option to recover that shortfall. Uh, it could say that. You, if you are you saying stop, that's the, that, po that possibility is here I'm anyway? I'm saying it's implicit anyway. That exists whether or not you resolve to do that or not. And, and you can't, but, sorry, um, you can't state that you will. Because no. every year you set your rates and that process is governed by legislation. You can't um, commit future councils to, a, to yeah. any aspect. Rates are annually and it can only at that point in time. Yeah, I understand that. Yep. Mm. Um. And the other aspect in terms of this financial year, if council makes a decision to introduce a targeted rate, I'll be challenged to get a targeted rate in for 1 July with the process we need to go through. There's a public notice process, I'd need to check, but there's certain dates in terms of public advertising and so forth that we need to consider. Um, so I'm just making that clear that okay. I haven't got the answer to that, but it might be a challenge. And, and I noticed in the report somewhere along the line it says that a target at rate is difficult to implement or something like that. I don't know where I saw it, but somewhere it was t uh, mentioned that it was it doesn't work with our current software or something like that. Is that right? So I think it's in comparison to just applying the DC policy with you know, the current policy with current staff, which is no more challenge, no, you know, has, adds no more challenge to business mm. as usual. Um, when compared to that, the targeted rate, I mean, it's just establishing a new instrument for council, uh, deploying it in a way that it hasn't done for us. So obviously we've got the gardens targeted rate, but this needs different thinking. So there are some costs and some difficulties that wouldn't exist in just using our policy. And just to learn from previous um, examples is trying to implement things in haste doesn't necessarily always result in a 100% error-free outcome. Um, well, you just got to do it properly, don't you? Yep, and removing the haste aspect. There's three aspects yeah. of project management, timely quality and cost. You can only have two. Okay. All right, okay. Um, no, nah, that's right. Okay, thank you. Councillor Sugi. Andrew, and look, thank you for the report, and I really appreciated the briefings we had prior to that. That was really uh, enlightening. The only other question, and the last question I've got, or only question I've got, is um, how, did, how, how do you think the developers will feel if you decide, oh, we're doing, we're using, we're, we're do, uh, 
require the disease on building consent or with some other developers to ask them at service connection. So it is, do you choose every time depending on the development or where we, when we need the money or yeah, how, how would they feel about that? <laughs> I know it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very subjective question, but uh, you, you, you might have thought about that as well. Yeah, so, well, I think you just go back to your first principles, which is that you um, apply the policy in a fair and equitable way, and that means that, um, that developers in similar circumstances, um, you know, would have the similar outcome. Remembering that the funding gap, um, where a developer is in the position, or, a, you know, where a series of developments, a development, wh whichever, is in a position where it's so-called created a gap, or what that means is that they're, they're not paying under a current policy that reflects the current circumstances, which is where most, uh, and ideally all developers sit. So what you're really doing is we're saying, hey, we want to just, um, we want to apply the policy in such a way that you're being treated as everyone else. Um, so I think it's that that would be my answer to that was <clears throat> that they are being just brought to a situation that's typical for every developer. Okay. Potentially look at this aspect of the policy as a mechanism, mechanism to bridge two policies in respect of making sure that the charges that are levied reflect the capital investment that's required to deliver the subdivision that they're looking for. And it gives okay. you the ability to manage it off. So like before I said in response to Councillor O'Leary's question, it's about matching demand against the infrastructure required to, to meet that demand. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so it's moved by myself, seconded by the Deputy Mayor. We'll go to debate. Okay, okay we'll go to the vote. The motion is carried, 7 4, 3 against. Okay, we'll come back at 5 to 12 uh, after a cup of tea.